Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're taking a look at AMD's latest Radeon RX 6000 series product. But before we get to that, quick explanation of why I'm filming here, why things look a bit different. As many of you know, I am building a new set, new studio, uh, and I'm in the moving in process at the moment. And this video sort of caught me out, so I'm having to make do. Audio is probably not gonna be as good as normal, but yeah, as I said, it's a bit of a make-do situation. I'm waiting on a few items before I can actually set up the new set, uh, some sound deadening material and stuff like that. So here we are, hopefully it works out. Anyway, as I said, we are looking at the latest Radeon 6000 series product. Exactly two months ago, we got the 6600 XT, and I think it's fair to say it arrived to a pretty lukewarm reception, at least from us. It was really nothing special. Uh, the MSRP was a bit too high, even if that means basically nothing these days, and the performance was a bit underwhelming. The limited 32 megabyte Infinity Cache didn't really appear to do a great job of making up for the anemic 128 bit wide memory bus, which when paired with 16 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory, only resulted in a bandwidth of 256 gigabytes per second. However, the 6600 XT did end up being a decent option in today's market, thanks to the best availability we've seen for a graphics card release in about a year now. Our GPU pricing update last month saw the 6600 XT selling on eBay.com for $640 US on average, while the slightly slower RTX 3060 typically sold for $710 US, and pricing is still pretty much the same today. Now, the expectation is that there'll be even more 6600s available at launch, so not only are your chances of buying one much higher than basically anything else on the market, but also your chances of getting one at a somewhat reasonable price are also quite high. So that's promising, though it does remain to be seen, but I'll be keeping this in mind as we check out the RX 6600. Speaking of which, the 6600 has been slapped with an MSRP of $330 US, so a $50 discount from the XT model, a mere 13% saving. And that 13% figure is worth holding on to as we go over the specs. So let's do that. Let's go over the specs before we jump into the testing. As the name implies, this is a cut down version of the 6600 XT. So it's based on the same 237 millimeter square die, packing 11.1 billion transistors. But of course, not all of them are active as the core configuration has been reduced from 32 compute units to just 28 CUs. And this sees a 16% reduction in stream processors from 2048 to 1792. The game GPU clock has also been reduced by a fairly substantial 13% from 2359 MHz to just 2044 MHz. Though the boost GPU clock has only seen a 4% reduction. AMD has also decreased memory performance, going with 14 gigabits per second memory, while the same 128 bit wide memory bus has been used. This decrease in memory throughput has dropped the overall bandwidth by 13% to just 224 gigabytes per second, the same memory bandwidth as the 5500 XT, though that particular RDNA part didn't enjoy the benefits of Infinity Cache. Thankfully, AMD hasn't downgraded the memory capacity, leaving the RX 6600 with 8 gigabytes of memory. However, the decrease in core memory frequency has reduced the board power rating from 160 watts down to 132 watts. And finally, like the 6600 XT, the non-XT version is limited to PCIe 4.0 times 8 bandwidth. So this means when installed in a PCIe 4.0 system, the reduction in bandwidth is a non-issue. However, performance related issues could arise when installed in a system that only supports PCIe 3.0, which currently is most systems. And this is because when using PCIe 4.0, the 6600 series connects to the CPU using a 16 gigabytes per second link, which is sufficient for modern graphics cards. And that's what you get with PCIe 3.0 times 16. However, when limited to an eight times interface, the bandwidth for the PCIe 3.0 system is reduced to just eight gigabytes per second. And we have found in the past that this can heavily limit performance, especially when fetching data from system memory. I did look into this with the 6600 XT review and found just a single example in today's games where this bandwidth limitation is an issue, and even then it could be quite easily worked around. Still, my concern is that this limitation will rear its ugly head in the future, and it could mean that the 6600 series won't age as well as NVIDIA's competing RTX 3060 series, but of course that is something that we'll have to investigate in the future. Now, for today's testing, I've managed to get my hands on the Gigabyte Eagle version of the RX 6600, and please note, as was the case with the XT version, AMD hasn't developed a reference card, though of course there is a reference PCB design, which AIB partners are free to use. 
Now, in total, I have tested 12 games at 1080p and 1440p using our Ryzen 9 5950X test system, which has been configured with 32GB of dual rank dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Also, because the 6600 is very similar to the 6600 XT in terms of design, I'm only going to go over half a dozen of the games tested, and then we'll look at the average performance seen across all dozen games. Okay, let's get into the results. Starting with F1 2020, we find results that are best described as predictable, with the new 6600 coming in 13% slower than the XT model, with 141 FPS on average. So, plenty of performance seen here at 1080p, though the RX 6600 only matched the 5600 XT, which will no doubt cause many of you to cringe, given that product carried an MSRP of $280 back in early 2020, and it wasn't exactly a great deal back then. Still, when focusing on the current generation products, it did at least match the RTX 3060. The 1440p results are less impressive, as here the RX 6600 finds itself towards the bottom of our graph, delivering RTX 2070-like performance, which admittedly isn't a bad result. That said, it does look a lot less favourable when compared to AMD's own products, with the 6600 again only able to match the 5600 XT, so quite a disappointing result there. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077, we find that the RX 6600 struggled even at 1080p with an average of just 60 FPS, though I suppose that was to be expected given the 6600 XT rendered just 69 FPS, making the new plane variant 13% slower. Again, we're looking at 5600 XT light performance from the new RX 6600, and although we're comparing two different generations of GPUs that sold in two very different markets, it is still hard not to be disappointed with that result and I'll talk more about this towards the end of the video. Increasing the resolution of 1440p really isn't an option when playing Cyberpunk 2077, as it'll drop the average frame rate to just 35 FPS, and we're already using tuned quality settings. Death Stranding is more 6600 friendly, as it allows for 135 FPS on average at 1080p, using the highest in-game quality preset. In fact, this is a much better result relative to other AMD GPUs than what we've seen previously, as the RX 6600 was able to match the RX 5700 this time, making it slightly faster than the RTX 3060, so not bad given it was 15% slower than the 6600 XT. We also see that 1440p is achievable here with an average of 95 FPS, though that did mean that the 6600 was 18% slower than the XT version, so quite a big margin there. And that also meant that, once again, we are looking at 5600 XT light performance, so a bit meh, if I'm honest. Next we have Horizon Zero Dawn, and this time the RX 6600 did match the 2060 Super and 2070, so in that respect it was quite good, though it was only 6% faster than the 5600 XT, which means at 1440p they're going to deliver basically the same level of performance. And here we are, of course, seeing just that, with the RX 6600 leading the 5600 XT by a mere 3% margin, with 64 FPS on average. That also meant that it was 15% slower than the 6600 XT, and 7% slower than the RX 5700. The second last game that we're going to look at is Rainbow Six Siege, and here the 6600 was 12% slower than the XT version, placing it between the RTX 2060 Super and RX 5700. That means it was just 5% faster than the 5600 XT. And that margin is reduced to just 3% in favour of the 6600 at 1440p, though again it was 12% slower than the XT model, so very similar to what we've seen in other titles. That being the case, let's wrap up the individual game benchmarks with Watch Dogs Legion. Starting with the 1080p data, we see that the 6600 is 10% slower than the XT model, which is a decent result, and it meant that the 6600 was able to match the RTX 3060, 2070, and 2060 Super. Finally, the 1440p results are again fairly similar to what we've already seen. The 6600 slips behind the XT model by a 12% margin, but it still managed to match the RX 5700 and RTX 2060 Super. Then when it comes to power efficiency, the RX 6600 is slightly better than the 5600 XT, we're only talking about a 26 watt reduction in total system usage for this example, and that is for roughly the same level of performance, so not amazing, though it was quite a bit better than the RTX 3060. Okay, so the Radeon RX 6600 didn't have any surprises for us. Performance was really as expected, and therefore I thought it best to only look at six games rather than all 12, get a bit repetitive. So let's move on to check out the average performance seen across the dozen game sample. 
Here we see that at 1080p, the standard RX 6600 was an average 14% slower than the XT version, which is right in line with the price cut. Essentially, you're looking at RX 5700 or RTX 2070 levels of performance here, which certainly isn't bad, but it's also very weak in terms of progress. Then at 1440p, the results are slightly less favourable, and although the 6600 was still 14% slower than the XT version, that meant it was now only matching the RTX 2060 Super, and just a smidgen faster than the 5600 XT. So there you have it, the Radeon RX 6600. Now what to make of it. Honestly, it is hard to say how good or bad the RX 6600 is right now, and really that will be determined over the coming weeks based on pricing and availability. Thankfully, I am hearing from retailers that availability will be strong, at least compared to other recently released uh, products, and we should see even more stock than what we saw with the 6600 XT launch. So that's positive. Unfortunately though, cryptocurrency miners now appear to be snapping up RDNA 2 GPUs, and at least locally here in Australia, 6600 XT pricing has shot up from around $700 to $900. And of course, most models are currently out of stock. I've been told locally pricing for the RX 6600 will typically be around $800, which is very high, though I do expect that we will see a few day one deals, maybe around $700, but that's a complete guess on my behalf. But in any case, if there are some special deals, expect them to disappear very quickly and never be seen again. And we saw the same thing with the 6600 XT just a few months ago. So sadly, things do once again appear to be trending in the wrong direction for PC gamers. As for the RX 6600, it's hard to comment on the performance just seen. In a normal market, there's no denying this product, it'd suck, let's be honest. $330 US would be a bad joke for this level of performance. It's an almost 20% price hike over an almost two-year-old product in the 5600 XT for a mere 6% performance increase at 1440p. Still, as it stands today, the RX 6600 is set to be the cheapest current generation graphics card you can buy, so there's that. The only problem being that if you have a working graphics card, it's not going to be worth the upgrade. It's really only an option for those of you without an alternative, if you want a game right now and you can't. So the 6600 is going to be the most cost effective way to get gaming. But having just seen the 6600 basically delivering 5600 XT-like performance, and not being a great deal better in terms of power usage, at least not to the degree that is going to make an ounce of difference for gamers, what's the point AMD? I guess you're getting a newer feature set with the 6600, though a wet mop will be just as useful for real-time ray tracing. So in short, the 6600, just like the 6600 XT, is an uninspiring product made palatable only by the current climate. It really does feel wrong recommending any graphics card right now, especially one that wouldn't be good value or anything remotely close to in a normal market. That being the case, you absolutely shouldn't buy a graphics card right now if you don't need to. But if you do need to, the 6600 is probably going to be the best option. The best of a bad situation probably is the best way to describe the Radeon RX 6600. So let's leave it at that for now. If you enjoyed this review, please do give it a like. And again, sorry if the audio and everything isn't up to our usual standards. As I said, moving into a new space and to get this review out on time, there was no other way to do it than fire up the camera basically in front of my computer and get it done. So hopefully that worked out okay. And soon we will have the new studio to use. So that's going to be fantastic and audio and all that will be good. Uh, also, if you'd like to support the channel, Floatplane, Patreon, links for those are in the video description. Things like our private Discord server you'll get access to, a uh, monthly live stream with Tim and myself, behind the scenes content, Q&A, a lot of cool stuff there, so if you're interested, check it out. Links are in the video description. If not, that is perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.